Welcome to the wonderful world of wine. We are your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lindsay. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Hello and welcome to The Wonderful World of Wine. We are your hosts, Kim and Mark. How are you this week, Mark? I'm great, Kim. How are you? Great. I'm fine, thank you. Always love to get together, even if it's still virtually, and uh, chat about some of the favorite things that we have in our lives, which is wine, wine and wine, wine. a little wine history this week, which is one of my favorite things, possibly some some wine science and some wine marketing. So things that we uh, that we find interesting and that we like to bring to your attention and make it a little bit different than just talking about grape varieties and styles of wine. So the first article that we want to talk about is from Wine Enthusiast magazine, and it's talking about a concept called bottle shock. Now, there was a, a movie a number of years ago with Alan Rickman called Bottle Shock that was about the wine competition of 1976. They called it the Judgment of Paris. And there was a scene in that movie where a number of bottles of Chardonnay folks pulled them out of out of a case and they were all brown. And they were like, "Ugh, our wine has gone bad. What the heck happened to it? And they talk about this concept of bottle shock or bottle sickness. And this is a real thing, isn't it? Yeah. And first off, great movie. And when I tell <laughs> I really, people about this. That's one of my favorite you, wine movies. <laughs> do you find this, Kim, that you'll say, oh, you will find a wine movie. We'll say, we'll tell people this is a great movie. And then they watch and like, what? Geeky. But, you know, like, <laughs> I know. Too much, right? For us, it's like great movie. It's about wine, right? So, and this was but out a I while also ago. really like Alan Rickman. So I'm like, yeah. yay, I get to watch him in yeah, Bottle he Shock. Was good. He's be Steven Spurrier. It's great. Yeah. And the winery was Chateau Montalena, which yes. is a very famous winery. And I, I was reading some articles about the movie, like the fact and fiction of the, the uh, mm -hmm. winery about this movie, it did turn brown, but the winemaker actually knew that there was a problem and how to correct it. Whereas in the movie, they didn't, they didn't know until like it was right. going to the competition. So, I mean, they know. Yeah, they, this, it was a little bit more dramatic in the movie. Yeah. So um, and there are a number sickness. of really great books on this entire subject. And I think one of the ones that I use in my BU class um, was actually the book that the, the movie was based off of. So there's a, uh, yeah, there's some dramatic effect. <laughs> Yeah. I guess you can say in the movie then that didn't really happen in real life. But still, the uh, the concept of bottles after they're after the wine is put in the bottles and they're corked up, that they go through this period of development that maybe they are acting like unruly teenagers and they're not exactly doing what they're supposed to be doing. And you don't necessarily want to open them up and drink them yet. Yeah, they call it bottle shock. They call it bottle sickness. They call it dumb, dumbness of the wine. And most common in white wines, like you said, Kim, after they are bottled, a little bit of oxygen is in there and it can change some things. And I wanted to ask you, Kim, and explain to our listeners, a lot of times in the past, we've talked about a bottle shock and dumbness as far as transporting a wine if it comes overseas or something that first initial, you want to let it settle. And I kind of get, well, I was getting confused early on about this instance in the, in the bottle shock movie and talking about when a wine is not showing well for other reasons due to, due to movement. Mm -hmm. Do you relate them in the same category or do you think there's a difference, a major difference between like the bottle shock issue versus the bottle sickness issue. I think that they're talking about the same thing. What I have also found is sometimes when wines are shipped, when they are too young, that they also suffer from this type of bottle sickness. Like you can't right after you bottle a wine because there's been so much jostling of the 
of the actual wine as it gets put in the bottle. I think that regardless of how far you're transporting it, whether you're putting it on a shipping container and shipping it halfway across the world, or if you're putting it on an airplane, or even if you're putting it on a truck and you're you know, sending it to somebody half an hour away, there is something to be said for letting wines that have just recently been bottled settle. Because I have definitely had some that were newly bottled and I knew right off the bat that they were not showing how they were supposed to show. And I think that that is to the detriment of the wine because if you ship it out too early or too soon or you know, you're know you sending it out immediately for a trade tasting and then you have all these people in a great big room tasting this wine, it is not going to be tasting like how you want it to taste and therefore people are not going to like it and then they're not going to want to sell it or buy it. So I think there definitely is something to be said for giving wines some time to settle down before they are released to the public. Yeah, they also call that like a travel sickness. Is travel well, sickness, yeah. You hear that a lot. That it's like, oh, it just came off the plane two days ago we, and it hasn't had time to settle down. So the winemaker may have this wine in a barrel. It's tasting great. And he says, I got to get this out. So he bottles it really quick and he ships it really fast. Usually a winemaker would take that wine from the barrel, bottle it, let it sit in his warehouse for a couple of months. Months, and yeah, then, months. And, and then ship it out. And mm-hmm. then it might sit in the warehouse it's received for a little bit before it's sampled out. So like Kim was saying, it, it can be really bad for them because they on their end, it's showing great out of the barrel. But wherever it gets to its final destination, it, it's an issue. So yeah. And I've seen this mostly with smaller wineries. So wineries that maybe don't have a lot of backstock that they can use for trade tastings or to fulfill orders that might be in the pipeline and they need to like just use every single thing that they have or for wineries that do something like, you know, maybe they have a a wine club where the benefits of belonging to the club is that you're the first one that gets to taste this new vintage. So yes, it's a benefit because you get the wine before anybody else does. But then the downside is that wine is still really very young. So my understanding, Kim, is there's no scientific definition of this. And it's not caused by a bacteria or yeast or anything like that, that we've talked about in the past. And how can we tell our listeners to spot this bottle shock or bottle sickness or if a wine is experiencing this how can we tell i know you You mentioned a little bit yeah it's more of an idea of the flavor just isn't as pronounced or as rich as you would like it to be it's tough because i feel like sometimes there can be overlap between you know if you have a very very mildly corked bottle And it doesn't smell like a wet basement, but it still has just stripped all the fruit from the wine. It could be that or it could be this. So I think it's difficult to tell people that, oh, if a wine is tasting like it's completely lacking in fruit, maybe it's this. Maybe it is bottle shock, but maybe it is also a TCA issue. So now I'm getting really geeky. Yeah. Well, so you feel it's more losing of flavor than losing of aroma or it can be both both i think both but also sort of a one noteness so like if a wine has been aged in oak all you're going to taste and smell is the oak it it the wine itself has not had enough time to integrate all of its flavors and have different components to it so you're not going to get the fruitiness and the oakiness and the spiciness and whatever else is supposed to be there because all of those parts have just not been able to meld together. So it's like if you make a beef stew, right, and you immediately eat it right after it comes off the stove, it might not taste as complex as if you leave it in the fridge for a couple of days because then all those flavors get to combine with each other and then your the stewiness of the stew just tastes so much better it doesn't taste like this is a carrot and this is a piece of beef all of those flavors working together so that's it's it's that integration and complexity issue for me i liked how you mentioned it's just like 
like a one note. So like if a yeah. wine is corked, I will get a, There's nothing. an aroma, but yeah. the, the flavor might be there and then it just, it goes away really fast. Whereas if it's a bottle sickness or travel sickness, it's just, there's nothing really there. It's like, it's almost like a Pinot Grigio. It's it's there. You know, it's a wine, but it, there's nothing there. So everybody's always kicking on Pinot Grigio. <laughs> oh, it's an example of oh. just it's there. Right. So you spot this issue. How can we fix it, Cam? Time, unfortunately. And if you've already opened the bottle, you're kind of stuck. I think the only thing that you can really do is, you know, put it in the refrigerator and let it sit there for a couple of days. And then when you're ready to drink it again, um, either decant it or, you know, pour it into a nice big wine glass and just give it a lot of air. Yeah. Aerate it like crazy, especially if it's a body open, you know, it's going to turn really fast and to decant it, decant it, decant it and aerate it after you decant it. And it might eventually open up for you. What about this, Kim? I was thinking with all the talk about screw cap wines and you hear in a term and screw caps we talked about called reduction, how would you compare, now we're going to get really geeky with this. How would you compare reduction of a wine to bottle shock? I think myself, it's pretty similar experience for the wine. That the wine is muted because yeah, of it. Correct. I would agree. And the difference, I think, in this is that when you have a reductive wine, it's going to come back to life a whole lot quicker than if Fast, you have a right. wine that is suffering from bottle shock. So if you pour that wine into your glass and give it three minutes worth of swirling, I think by then it's going to jump right back to life as opposed to one of these bottle shock wines that needs a couple of days. Yeah, you got to work it. You got to swirl it a lot, lot more, right? Mm-hmm. Days. Let me ask you this. A lot of the bottle shock and the sickness is due to transportation and vibration. If you buy a bottle in a, in a store and then you put it in your car and, and travel with it and then bring it to someone's house, do you think a wine can get a bottle shock like that? Hmm. I've never thought about that. Because I was thinking I'm, a few times I remember tr transporting a wine and I just thought it didn't show as well. Yeah. And the only thing I was thinking, it wasn't that it didn't experience any rest beforehand. It's just that when I transported it. So I'm hmm. thinking maybe the vibration, there might be some wines, short term vibration that could happen. And I'm just curious if you ever experienced it. I probably have and just didn't recognize it for what it was. When I think of bottle shock, honestly, I think about that, you know, if a, if a, wine has been on an airplane, not only is it vibration, but it's also pressure changes. But a lot of wine transported is not going by airplane. It's going by super boats. Right. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Hmm. It's I would funny. hope that a 25 minute drive in the car <laughs> would not yeah, result no, I'm talking in like a, a long term, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, and especially ride. so like if you're shipping your wines across the country if you are a winemaker in california and you have a a truck that you put them on because you need to ship to your distributor in massachusetts that's a legitimate i think concern and question i think of that a lot when someone sends me a wine in the mail i'll let it sit for a couple of days just because you don't know what it's gone through to get yeah. to you so that's a good point to bring a up good question it's funny you mentioned that about the shipping. I just saw a thing, a joke. I would assume it was a joke. Was two gentlemen were out on a raft out of, off of California. I saw Chicago. this too. Did you see it? They're holding up a <laughs> sign. It says, what does it say? We want our wine. Where's my wine? Where's my wine? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny we saw that. Yeah, shipping delays and all of these issues with products that are in a backlog and are, you know, wait or they're waiting at some port somewhere you got to imagine that there's a lot of wine on there i've noticed it with a number of different wines i don't Kava, think it's especially. as bad as other industries or supplies and it, it was a gentleman in sales was mentioned to me the other day he feels that this is the year of wine sales for holiday because people are going to go looking for everything else and it's and not, not going to be, be in the there. stores, but you'll always find a bottle of wine on the shelf. But then we've heard recently that there are issues with glass availability. 
Yeah. Yeah. But there's enough wine in the pipeline that getting what is currently at wineries into bottles is not going to impact anything in the next, say, six months on store shelves for people. So, yeah, we're hoping the same thing. It's like, well, you know, if you can't get that gift for your spouse that you really, really want to get, why don't you pull together a case or two of their favorite wines or, you know, sign them up for a wine class. <laughs> so we're saying that, you know, there's there's no uh, no supply chain issue with uh, with wine education. Right. There's always something else coming. You're listening to The Wonderful World of Wine. We are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone. To get more information about Kim, please go to her website at commonwealthwineschool.com. To get more information about myself, please go to franklinlickers.com. For past episodes, you can go to SoundCloud or iTunes. And we're here every week on WFPR 102.9 FM in Franklin. Next is the article Kim is excited to talk about is she's a history buff and not only loves wine, but she loves history. We found an article that was about the Romans, my, my buddy, the Romans, and did the fall of the Roman Empire happen because they had lead poisoning. And when I saw this article, Kim, I thought, this sounds really interesting. It must have something to do with wine. And yes, it kind of does. And what did you think, Kim? Good history, myth? What were your thoughts on it? A little of both. <laughs> so there's still a lot of debate in historical circles, archaeological circles, sociological circles about what caused the fall of the Roman Empire. And some scholars like to look at the physical manifestations of what might have brought the empire down. This is, I think, one of those areas where people are looking at, okay, what are the pipes made of? What are people consuming? You know, what are the chemical issues that are going on in their lives that maybe made them sick? Um, so this idea that there could be lead poisoning and Part of that with water, but then also part of that with wine and alcohol, because we know that alcohol dissolves a lot of different compounds that water does not. But then there are also, you know, other scholars who say, no, it was more, you know, sociological or because of this or because of that. So this is one theory that is out there about what are some of the reasons why the Roman Empire ultimately uh, fell in the, the early centuries of common era. So the premise is that folks living during Imperial Rome had a lot more lead in their system than folks living during the Bronze Age. And so they're postulating that over time, lead was building up in people's systems and this caused more, uh, more disease, more cancer, other things like memory loss, anemia, problems with your teeth, you know, like all of these physical problems that we know that lead can cause to human beings. So it's an interesting theory. Um, it's not necessarily a proven theory, but one of the things about that's interesting about lead is that until we knew in more modern times that lead was very detrimental to the human body, it was put in everything because there's a chemical change when lead is mixed with certain liquids that it produces a sweet flavor. So lead was often used in cooking vessels because it would brighten up and sweeten up certain things. And it's, it's just a really useful metal. So it, it found a place in a lot of things that humans would use, whether it be, you know, pipes or makeup or lots of other things. So there were many, many ways that lead could get into people's bodies. And there was just this one situation in ancient Rome where because when you mix it with juice, like grape juice and boil it down, it really adds to the sweetness and the flavor of the juice. So it was used in a lot of cooking vessels which then people would consume the food that was made in the cooking vessel and would take the lead into their system, which is not good. There was so much written about this, Kim. The, the Roman Empire ended 476 AD, 
And this article was in ARS Technica, I believe was the, the company. It was a, mm-hmm. it was a American chemical society video that was incorporated into the article. And then way back, well, way back, 1983, the <laughs> that's New way England back. journal, yeah, <laughs> that's way back. The journal of medicine actually did an article about this. And there was also a book written about it. And I found a lot of things that were saying the gentleman who wrote the book didn't know what he was talking about because mm-hmm. it was a common thing and whatever. He, he was a chemist kind of trying to explain things. But you mentioned the symptoms of poisoning, the, the lead poisoning, nervous disorder, uh, memory loss, uh, concentration, infertility. And they meant on the nervous disorder about, they were talking about Caligula. Did you see this about the emperor's who if they thought he was so nuts, he appointed a horse to be on his council. There are so many stories about the crazy stuff that they were just crazy that the a Romans- bunch of that so many of the emperors. And yeah, like as someone who reads history, you know, and you need to be aware that history is written by people <laughs> and people yeah, yeah. have a particular bent to what they are writing based on their opinions and and things. So I think we need to be careful when we read what people have written about what these folks, you know, 2000 years ago did, because it's not necessarily based on archaeology and physical findings. It's based on other people's writings and things like that. So Maybe they weren't as crazy as the writings make them out to be, or maybe they were. So it's just, it's hard when you're only going from the written sources. They mentioned a lot of things of, of how they, the, why they used the lead. And it was saying about the low, it has a low melting point. It was widely avail- available. It's a it terribly is, useful metal. Yeah, it's just, malleable. it's too bad that it's toxic to humans because it's yeah. really very, well, did, very useful. To you, to your point on that, they didn't know. Just like I remember years ago, people telling me they used to play with mercury oh, in yeah. science class, right? And that's um, we're talking the fifties, right? So it wasn't too long ago. So I can see where they found this substance, and they had all sorts of uses. The the fact that they had water pipe systems or aqueducts and they learned to use or have that system was amazing for back mm-hmm. then technology they also, sure yeah they also lined the coffins with the lead so i think in the bodies they dug up that might have touched the coffins it might have impacted and they don't even know if that was why they were alive right. that that lead yeah. was in their system so the cops and then we have to talk why we're talking about this is how they used it in their wine. You mentioned the food, Kim, but tell our listeners how they actually drank it with wine. So the ancient Romans, just like the ancient Greeks, didn't consume wine the way that we consume it today, right? So we open a bottle of wine. We assume that the wine in that bottle really is just fermented grape juice. And if you listen to our show, often, <laughs> you know, that we usually talk about, you know, oh, there's other things that maybe can be used in the production. But for all intents and purposes, what is in our bottle of wine is just coming from grapes and yeast. But ancient folks who drank wine didn't necessarily drink wine that was completely unadulterated. They liked to do other things to their wine, add other things to their wine to change the flavors up. So one of the things that they would do is they would add lead grape juice <laughs> that had lead. So grape juice that had been boiled down to a syrup, and then they would add that syrup to their wine. And that syrup was boiled down in containers that contained lead. So that one of the ways that that lead could get into wine. But you could also they would also add that syrup to other foods as well. So it was really the equivalent of like sugar or corn syrup. You know, the way that we sweeten foods these days, they would use that syrup to sweeten their foods, yeah, including four, adding it to their wine. Four hundred and fifty recipes, they estimate that they would use that in as a sweetener. And that's just not, from not just not just wine. <laughs> just from one guy's cookbook so yeah yeah so it's pretty crazy 
So I guess the bottom line is uh, don't drink as the Romans did, right? I mean, be... be not uh, with the lead. Maybe drink the like lead. the Greeks did and put seawater in your wine. Oh, that doesn't sound much better. It's just interesting. There was there's so much. Did you see anything that you that stuck out and why you would say this, you know, there's no way. I mean, obviously it made him sick, but they, I think they, like you said, they had a lot of other issues that caused the, uh, the downfall. There was, well, I think it's, it's hard to determine if this was actually the cause. And I think that the, the archeology span is interesting where they were measuring the amount of lead found in bone fragments of iron age, people from the British Isles versus Roman Empire pe- people also from that same uh, region outside of London. And your point about, well, they buried them in lead, in lead coffins. So maybe the lead was you know soaked into their bones. So I think that even the archaeology is very incomplete at this point. So I, I think it's really hard. And especially to answer a big question like what caused the fall of the Roman Empire. It's, it's not going to end up that the answer is this one thing. So can we say that lead damage to brains and bodies maybe had a, a part to play in it? Probably. But I, I have a hard time saying, you know, this was the main cause of it because we're talking about so many people in such a vast area and and so politically complex and culturally complex and religiously complex that there's it's got to be more than just the equivalent of eating lead paint. They did talk how they tested the skeletons, like you were saying, Kim, and they mentioned oh, like they could tell if it was a co- I would say a commoner versus royalty, and the royalty had higher levels. But it, like you said, it could have been associated how they were buried, or mm-hmm. a lot of them wore makeup that was also yep. led then the the poorer people didn't have it but it was i found it was interesting they documented because they can test the period of the of the test they're doing that they found the high levels of lead pretty much after every major event of the romans fell they could link it to high lead being detected in bodies at that time so during like the gothic wars when the arabs and that's why they're kind of bringing it all back to that led to the fall, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which was interesting. I mean, it does, it's, it's almost like the, um, you know, how bear saved the world or is <laughs> related to everything type of story. You can right. relate it, you know, yep. the other thing, the Kevin Bacon, you can always relate everything to. <laughs> so it's the six degrees of lead instead of six yeah, degrees of, exactly, of Kevin Bacon. Exactly. So like you can find one thing that goes one way and, but interesting. I wouldn't want to have had that wine though. I think it just, uh, you know, let's add some lead. Let's <laughs> lead and. Lead. But you didn't know it was bad for you at the point. Yeah, so. yeah. But they hit was yeah. That's true. Thank you for listening to us today on the wonderful world of wine. We've been your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lindsay. You can find our past episodes on SoundCloud or iTunes and our Facebook page at The Wonderful World of Wine. And listen to us every week on Franklin Public Radio, 102.9 WFPR. Cheers. Wine, wine.